Jia Ba Bui. Good, very good. So we're now just waiting for slides to come on. So it's the awkward dance for waiting. And I'm messing it around. Um, so before I start, I'm very happy to be back in my hometown. I'm very happy to be reunited with my Desi Gao Siu Dai, my Chai Tao Gui, uh, and to speak about a topic that I'm very, very passionate about, privacy. Sorry, slide's not on yet, so still waiting. So um, one thing about this talk, I haven't been living in Singapore for the last 10 years. I've been based in the States. I work out of San Francisco. Um, and if, so the idea of privacy in Asia, we've done some work in Asia, but I'm very interested to continue the, the discussion. So please feel free to contact me, tweet at me, uh, send me direct messages on my Twitter account. I'll love to continue on this, um, the discussion about privacy in Southeast Asia. And the clicker is not working. And the slides are not showing there as well. I swear I came yesterday to check all the tech. It was all working yesterday. Try one more time. Oh, too fast. Great. So. Still transferring. So, um, my name is. Um, so, we all know, as you all heard before, behavior change, designing for behavior change is actually really, really hard. Uh, most of the time, when we talk about, you know, when you're designing something, people always tell you to, you know, do research, understand people's mental models, create that design, make it as intuitive as possible. So, to think about designing for change. To think about designing for changing someone's viewpoint, to think about designing for a human behavior, fundamental human behavior change, it's very, very, very difficult. Um, and this is the wicked problem that I've been facing for the last couple of years. So I have been working on this wicked problem, uh, and that's why I decided to take a different tactic today. Instead of trying to design for you know, uh, users, I'm going to talk to you people here. My name is Venetia Tay. I work for a not-for-profit, mission-driven company called uh, Mozilla. Most of you might have used the product before called Firefox. Uh, it's a web-based browser. We are actually more than just a browser. We have apps, we have code, we have tools. And the whole idea is to uh, keep the web open and free. We do a lot of education and advocacy to make sure that the open web is free and accessible to all. My background is um, I'm actually sing uh, from Singapore. Uh, I went to Singapore Management University, if any one of you out there who have SMU. Um, hello. Um, I am, uh, you know, I'm a business strategist uh, with a design research background and field research, a mixed method um, technologist. I also, before I joined Mozilla, I was at Frog Design, a, desi a global design innovation firm where I was at one of the where I was actually an impact, social impact lead, and I co-led the San Francisco design research team. I also do side projects with someone called Jan Chip Chase in his studio called Studio D. So at Mozilla, my role is head of audience insights. Uh, I use research insights and I work across the organization with different departments to use research and insights to help them strive strategic direction. Uh, help them make strategic decision making. So teams from like marketing to emerging technologies to open innovation and product are teams that I constantly work with as well. As I mentioned, we have been tackling with this problem for quite a while, is how do I make users care about your safety your, and being safe online? How do I make people care about privacy uh, without using fear tactics? It's so easy to paint a horrible picture of always everything that goes wrong, but that's not the way we do at Mozilla. Um, so that's the wicked problem I've been grappling with, and that's why, as I mentioned today, I want to address all of you. You are you know, designers of systems, designers of products. You are system, uh, you think about products that you create, 
You are also architects of algorithms. You are very important, and that's why today I want to talk to you guys and have you all think about designing for user-centered privacy. So if my guess is that all of you here today care about user-centered experiences. I mean, this is UX Southeast Asia, right? Um, and if you really believe in customer centricity, human-centered design, you know, you have a responsibility of keeping your user data safe. Data is the new currency. We've heard it all the time. Data is the new oil. You know, we have data-driven design. In fact, I think there was a, a, a talk yesterday that talked about data-driven UX. And, and you know, being data-driven is the new sexy thing to put on your resume. Um, but given that data is the new currency, how are you and your companies really managing it and how are you really using it? So we really believe that respecting your user's privacy should be an experience principle. Everything that you do, everything you design, should really con be considering the user's privacy. And the respect that you have for your users will create a better experience for them at the end of the day. So I'm going to touch on a little bit about the state of privacy. I do a lot of global research. I've interviewed people across Europe, Asia, um, America, and if people who are not familiar with privacy, these are things they often say. I'm not a target, I'm so insignificant. I'm not a celebrity. You find, this is actually very interesting. A lot of people across multiple cultures will say this. I'm not a, ce a celebrity. There's nothing interesting about me at all. And last one, very common, I have nothing to hide. So yeah, I don't need to maintain my privacy because I have nothing to hide. And if you look at the other end of the spectrum, people who are probably more tech aware, they are aware that companies are taking their data, they are aware about the privacy issues out there. This is what we hear them say. It's so much work. I would trade my privacy for convenience. All the people out there using Chrome, you know who you are. I worry about every if I worry about every little thing in my life, I won't be able to live my life. There's so much bigger problems out there. There's climate change, there's taxes, there's you know, Trump's in government right now. So many things to worry about. If I have to worry about privacy, I really cannot live my life. And last one, which is also very common is, this is the way the world works. We're fucked. You know, every company out there collects my data. If I don't give them my data, I cannot use the product. And this is the way the world works. And what about Singapore and in Asia? We have a very family-centered view of our society. Privacy, we, to some, we often have privacy. What privacy? You know, we, we have a kampong mentality. We all live so close together. How? Uh, and most people actually also, like, if you're probably not married, if you're Singaporean and not married, you're probably still living with your parents. So a little bit hard to have individual privacy. In the work that we do in Indonesia, family and friends are very important. It's very common for people to actually lend their mobile phone to each other for a short period of time. Um, and this is quite common in many other Southeast Asian countries like Myanmar and Thailand as well. And um, I remember growing up in Singapore, uh, I used to help my mom fill up Lucky Draw like coupons at um, NTUC Fair Price, where I write down her IC number, her phone number, her address, and then we put it into this transparent box outside of NTUC. Anyone can see your NRC number and your address. And the truth is, a lot of Singaporeans are actually willing to give up their personal information just to have a discount or just even the chance of winning a crockery set, they are willing to kind of give that up. So the two common terms that are often, a lot of research has been done on privacy. The researchers always talk about these two key um, privacy like terms. One is the privacy paradox. People are concerned about privacy, they say they're concerned about privacy, but when it comes to actions, they actually don't do anything about it. So that's the privacy paradox. The second one is the privacy cynicism. Like, 
they just feel powerless that everything's all screwed up. There's nothing they can do about it. So they, to a certain extent, they just kind of give up. So again, these are two very common, like if you read anything on privacy literature, these are the two common stated terms. And you know, we have seen a recent shift in the world with more and more data privacy regulations coming up. I'm sure most of you have at least heard of the GDPR, which is an EU-based data protection um, statement. Um, and it has inspired a lot of other countries to start putting in their own data privacy practices as well. In short, you know, the, if you want to think about design and GDPR, that's an entire talk in itself that probably would take two, three hours if you wanted to sit through all of that. But in short, it really gives users the right to their own data. Um, you have the ability to have the right to be forgotten. So if you wanted a company to delete your data, they have to. And there are a lot of other regulations that they have to look at. So uh, companies out there, and I'm sure you might be some of the companies out there as well, are really gathering and paying to determine how trustworthy you are. For example, the, a recent article that came up about two weeks ago in the New York Times talked about you know, people accessing their secret consumer score and being quite surprised about how much information companies actually have on you. In this example, this person actually uh, went through a company called SIF to actually try to see how much companies know about him. And it said that you know, what he found was shocking. You know, it's more than 400 pages long. It talks about every single message that this person had sent on Yelp, years of Yelp delivery, anything on Airbnb. He made a complaint on Airbnb. It was listed down there as well. You know, anytime he had opened his like, Coinbase on his phone, that was actually recorded as well. So all these entries, including the IP address, which tells you exactly where you're located, is all contained by this company and other companies can actually go out there and purchase that information about you. And for most of us, we actually don't know how much of our own information is out there. Uh, in India, um, so in often, this India has an uh, identification number thing called Adaha. Uh, it's really looking at combining user government data together with corporate data. Oftentimes, most companies like to be able to create a seamless experience for their user, so allow you to kind of link things together. Uh, in this case, the government ID has to be, uh, oftentimes has to be used with some of the corporate data. So for example, if you use Amazon, um, if you use Amazon, um, if you want, if you didn't get your package at your home and you go and pick it up, you actually have to show your government ID code and then they can find your package and then give it back to you. This is very concerning because combining corporate, um, your government data and your corporate identity really reveals a lot about you uh, and companies can actually start purchasing them from the government. It's for sale. Um, uh, apart from that as well, transparency and the privacy is lacking in that system. So if you're interested to find out more about this, Mozilla Foundation has done a lot of extensive work and is working with the counterparts in India to try to move this along. So if you, if you Google or you search Mozilla Foundation out of heart, you'll read more about this topic. What about Singapore? I'm speaking in Singapore today, um, and these are just my thoughts, uh, and it's not a reflection of, I guess, how I see Singapore specifically. So in Singapore, about four or five years ago, we started with uh, a plan, the government started a plan called the Smart Nation, which basically, in short, it's you know, wanting us to be up there with the Silicon Valleys of the world. There is nationwide digitization from ERP to all the way to health records being digitized. Um, in fact, if you look at some of the speeches that our government officials have said, they talk about wanting to kind of be responsible about data gathering so that it really creates a sim seamless platform where all your users' data can kind of be in one. And what that means that if you went to one government agency and then work with another government agency, it's very easy because everything's on a single platform. In fact, I think the IMDA um, minister, will, who actually need his, my speaker knows to actually remember his, his, his exact name, 
um, he talked about the future of creating this data exchange platform in Singapore where users can actually responsibly give their data and be able to sell the data to the right people. So in Singapore, we really are thinking about being a very smart nation. And also in Singapore, like data breaches happen across the world. Uh, in Singapore, I'm sure you all know, um, we are not immune to it as well. In Singapore, we see privacy equiv equivalent to cybersecurity. Um, they, are, they work in hand in hand, but they are same, same, but different. Um, security, cybersecurity and security is really about thinking about building a fortress around to protect the data, whereas privacy really thinks about what's actually in the fortress that should be protected. So when you read a lot of reports about Singapore and privacy, very often they think about how we need to make our system secure, but they think less about the data that needs to be inside of it. So, for example, when there's a K-Box breach, which I'm not sure all you're familiar, but K-Box is a really popular karaoke joint. Why would they need your NRC number? Just because you are a foreigner with uh, maybe the, the what is it, blue card, does it mean that you choose better songs than a Singaporean who's Chinese living in Jurong? There's no real need for a K-Box as a company, a karaoke company, to actually have your NRC number. And the Singapore government actually does, did recon, does recognize that. So in September 2019, uh, Singapore has introduced um, a, a thing called the protection, like a protection data regulation, where it's really educating citizens to really be mindful of who you give your NRC number to uh, and what they will be using it for. So for example, the days of me putting my mom's NRC number on a lucky draw form into NTUC, those days are all gone now. And this is a recent development that happened in September 2019. The other regulation that has come up as well, it's called the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Man Manipulation Bill. In short, it's the anti-fake news um, bill. And the main idea is that a lot of misinformation can be spread, especially through private communication channels like email, WhatsApp, Viber, what, and all the other different uh, message channels that you have. And the government wants to be able to quell that misinformation. So they talk about fines up to $1 million if you are caught spreading misinformation. The big thing to think about is how does the government actually able to police your private social media channels, your private messages. We are Singapore, they will find a way. The other thing as well is, um, I'm sure you all know there are a lot of security cameras around in Singapore. It is the third most surveilled state outside of China. If you think about it, it's 15.25 cameras for every 1,000 people in Singapore. Um, so this is interesting itself. So why does privacy matter? I know we talk about you know, surveillance, and in all honesty, surveillance may not all be that bad. In Singapore, surveillance means that we have a very, very strong um, counter-terrorism strategy. I know this because when I was growing up in Singapore in 2000s with all the terrorism activity that were happening, I was glad that there was surveillance within Singapore because it meant that we were protected. It meant that we would figure out problems before that happened. So it may not always be that bad. But I could paint you, like how many of you here have actually watched Black Mirror on an episode of Black Mirror? Okay, that's quite a lot of people. That's like more than uh, three quarters of the crowd. Um, I could paint you a dystopian future of what lack of privacy actually means that will come out straight from a Black Mirror episode. And the scary part is, many parts of the world, this is already happening. Totalitarian governments across the world have used personal identifiable information and data to identify vulnerable communities and people at risk. Um, we also think about you know, filter bubbles that uh, show you specific things that you should be looking at give you a very close-minded view of the world. I mean, that's the US in short. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you think about it, in all of the research that I do as well, uh, doxing is a real problem. 
So for example, we've talked to people who are LGBTQ who have been outed before they were ready to be outed. In some cases, they have lost their jobs, which is one thing, but in other cases, they have been threatened in real life and their life was at risk, all because they didn't, wasn't able to actually protect their own privacy. So we may not live in such a dire situation. Most of us are not living in a totalitarian government. Filter bubbles may not be that big a problem. Um, so does that mean that you know, privacy is still OK? Um, some of my people I talk to in Singapore just say, is the lack of privacy just mean that you just see more targeted ads? You know, I am shopping for a pair of shoes online. You know, I didn't buy it yet. And that sh pair of shoes follows me online. Everywhere I go on the internet, I see the ad for the pair of shoes over and over again for the next two weeks. And even if I bought that shoe, it still shows up. Um, and that honestly is irritating. It's not dire. Like I, it's not life-threatening at all. It's just a bit irritating. So I'm going to talk about how lack of privacy can really affect you people in a way that I think you all will really, really resonate with you. So in the, in the research that we've done in India, um, we, a lot of the users in India use uh, a VPN. And when we ask them why, it's, they say things like, we want to watch our Korean dramas. Um, another reason is that I use music streaming services if I don't use a VPN, all I get is Bollywood music suggestions. Um, our Indian users believe that they have a right to have uh, no restrictions on the content, and they should be allowed to see whatever they want to see. So that's one. How many of you have bought airline tickets online before? Raise your hands. And do you notice sometimes when you keep checking the price, it keeps going up? and you don't know why, and if you're not using incognito mode or the Firefox browser, it tends to kind of go up. Um, there are studies that also show that if you are a Mac user, you actually see higher prices than your, your friend who uses Windows. <laughs> and that's because they assume that you can afford a Mac means you've got money. Uh, and this is actually studies out there that shows. So it's, yeah, so practically, you know, if we, you like your privacy, it means that you see more expensive airline tickets. The other thing, insurance premiums. Um, what if your insurance premiums went up because you've been searching and Googling? What does this mall mean? Insurance companies could then purchase that, that your search history and then say that, hmm, she's got a weird mall on her arm. I think it could be cancerous. Because of that, let's charge, them charge her higher insurance premiums just in case. Um, in studies in the US as well, they might charge you higher prices if you live closer to a McDonald's and they just assume that you eat McDonald's every day. You can also see your transaction like you often eat McDonald's. So your insurance premiums will rise based on the things you search, the things you talk about with your family, any small concern that you might have, and this is a real problem. And this is something that companies are actually talking about right now. So this could be a close near future. Lastly, um, menstruation apps or period apps. Um, a lot of women use them to help them track their periods, their cycles. They put in sensitive information in there, like when your period start, when it ends, how you feel about it, when do you have sex. All of that information is contained in apps so that they can kind of predict what will happen next and kind of show you all of that. Um, this information has been and could be sold or leaked to people. So imagine if you know, they find out that you are you know, trying to get pregnant, your company could decide to fire you first because they don't want to pay for your maternity benefit. But because you're not yet pregnant, they have no, you have no case against them. So think about your mom, your sister, your girlfriend, your wife, if this happens to them, because they were trying to you know, you know, record for themselves, but this could be a big problem for them. And this just scratches the surface of what it means to have lack of privacy. So I'm gonna show you a couple of case, uh, one case study. How many of you are familiar with Strava? 
Okay, for those who are not familiar with Strava, it's kind of like a social network for exercises. So a lot of people would kind of track how they run or like where the routes that they run or cycle. So uh, back when Strava actually kind of, like Strava actually is good in the sense that they let you kind of um, turn on and turn off your location data. But most people and users don't actually realize that. So a lot of things get recorded up into their Strava system. So in this case, um, Strava actually released a global heat map of all the GPS points where the people in the community have been exercising. And it basically outlined all, a lot of the US military bases across the world. Why? Because a lot of the military bases could, for be example, be in the middle of the desert, and you see over and over again an outline, which basically means that people could be working out within the building and just kind of doing circles in the building. Uh, and that's pretty much how they found a lot of US military uh, websites, uh, sorry, bases, which usually aren't found uh, in most maps for obvious reasons. So military bases have been exposed as a result of that. Perhaps even closer to home, for a lot of you, your boyfriend can be exposed. So there was an article in Wired magazine where this woman talked about how she, you know, lying in bed, I opened my Strava app, you know, and observed there was another person, a cyclist whose profile was set to public, had burned 2,000 calories with my boyfriend. I have not yet put on pants. And then because a lot of the information is public, um, this encourages, as most of us would do if we have boyfriends or ex-boyfriends or girlfriends, um, stalking. So you're checking out this person who could be a new competition. So like she, this, in this case, because of Strava, she could track this new person's like route, how this person like cycles to work, where she ate, the, where she drank her beer. She knew how many calories she was burning out and how often. And you know, pretty much like you know, whom she's spending the time with, i.e. her boyfriend. Um, TLDR, they did break up and the uh, boyfriend did end up uh, going out with this girl that was not her, that they were tracking. So boyfriend could be exposed as well. So the other question I get, isn't it up to the user to protect their own privacy? Uh, and that is a large part of the work that I do at Mozilla. I spend a lot of time trying to figure out the mental models of people's privacies offline, how that relates to on the online world. I think a lot about how we engage users, um, which is why I said today is a different tactic. We're trying to talk to people who are doing the design. So yes, there are the privacy settings, the profile settings that you can set. But when you think about it, who's the one who decides which data is being collected? Who are the people who decides how the algorithms are being built? Who is deciding what information a user should be putting in um, to a system? Who decides what is opt-in and what's opt-out? The answer actually is all of you here. You are those decision makers, oftentimes in your company. So what can you do? I'm gonna give you four areas to consider and think about and maybe take it back to your companies uh, and discuss it with them. The first one is a lean data policy. This is something that Mozilla has worked on and we've done lots of work on it and this is something that we frequently talk about um, and propose. The Lean Data Policy basically says that you only collect what you need. So we all know data is a new currency. Most people know that companies are collecting data. Most people don't know when, what, why, what it's used for, who does it go to after you sell to the company. N most users don't have any clue about that. And yes, it is true, some data collection is necessary. But make sure that all the data that you collect provides a direct user benefit. I know this is really, really hard, especially in a Singapore context where we're very gasu, where you're afraid that if I don't collect that, what if I need it down the road? How? Like, I can't just go back and ask for it. Which is why you have to be very, very strategic and really think about in advance what is it that you need and only collect that. 
So data is a new currency as designers. And I use this work very loosely. You could be a researcher, you could be a developer, you could be you know, a business person. You are all designing systems, processes within your company. So as a designer, I want you to think about you know, when, what, why, and what the data is going to be used for. Can, the other question to ask yourself is, you know, can your work still function if a user refrains from giving you that piece of information? Can you still operate and do the work that you want to? So if you are going to collect data, you know, operate in good faith and, op and be open by default. So some things is number one, no surprises. Be transparent and disclose the benefits to the users. We collect this and therefore this, this is the thing that you get out of it. Number two, user control. Put users control in their own data and their online experience. Don't force them to make a choice that they didn't intend to. Give them options to opt out if needed. Number three, limited data. Collect what you need, de-identify where you can, and delete when no longer necessary. At Mozilla, uh, we have a very strong data review collection um, process, and you actually can check it out on our wiki. We basically make a case for every single piece of data collected. You can find out what we collect, why we collect it, and what we're going to use it for. And once we're done with it, we actually delete it from our systems. So this is a somewhat popular Singaporean website. Can someone tell me why do you th how do you think you could improve this online experience? You can shout it out if you know the if you think you know the answer. Okay. So if you look at this, the two options they give you to check out basically ask you to log on to Google or to Facebook. That's the only two options. If you don't have Google, you don't have Facebook you actually cannot check out this shopping cart. So from, a, from the designer who created this, I'm sure that person was thinking, easy what? You just connect everything, you don't need to fill up. It's very seamless and easy for the user. And that is true. But if you think about it, this also means that both your company and Facebook can actually exchange the data and have a lot more information about your user. So this experience could be improved by having a third option where the user can check out as a guest so they can limit the information and data they want to give to this company. Secondly, researchers as stewards of data. How many of you out there do research in your company or are researchers? Raise your hands. Okay, quite a few. So this is... The glass room. Uh, the glass room is a pop-up that Mozilla, together with Tactical Tech, have created, and it kind of travels the world. By the world, I mean right now it's mostly Europe and uh, the US. And basically, it's an interactive exhibition that showcases our lives and technology, how it changes and how it's effective us, and how we can impact technology as well. Uh, this is one of the education things that Mozilla does to help the public actually understand what privacy and data and open internet actually mean. So for example, um, one exhibit that we had here um, is actually a couple of like five thick booklets, like phone booklets of all the passwords that were leaked in the LinkedIn data breach. Um, and it's priceless to see people flip through the book and actually find their password in there. Uh, you'll be surprised actually there's a lot of permutations of the word Singapore. Uh, with number 88 uh, in this book as well. So a lot of Singaporean data is actually in there because I can't imagine other countries putting Singapore as a password. Small caps, big caps. Um, and as part of experience, we actually invite people who go through the exhibit to leave their comments after that. This was an interesting one. After visiting the classroom, I feel terrible. I worked as a researcher at Apple 
I've moderated many studies on facial recognitions that is now informing the AI algorithm. We didn't know. So being a researcher at Mozilla, we do adhere to the lean data policy. Uh, number one is we collect limited uh, PII, also known as personal identifying information. No last names um, as possible. So all, and all, any of our data sheets actually omit the person's last name. Uh, we also are not allowed to collect a person's physical address because sometimes we do research when you go to people's houses or their offices. We're not allowed to collect any of that in advance, only until the participation, participants actually confirm, then we're allowed to do that. And the reason it's you know, um, limited lean data policy, you know, if you don't know you're going to visit a person, why do you need that person's home address? Thirdly, all raw data is deleted after a year. So in any of our researchers, you know, we keep our reports, obviously, but anything that has any raw data is all wiped out from our systems after a year. And lastly, we do map the whys to the data that we want to collect. We have to make legal makes us make a claim exactly on why do we want this piece of data, and we actually have to almost create like a business case to make a reason of why we actually can do that. Like our legal team believes that you only need three points of information about a user, you can identify exactly who they are. So we're trying very hard to limit that. So what does that mean as well? Um, well I don't see a lot of like photos of participants here at this conference, but if you go to a lot of other research conferences or IXDA conferences, people do talk about their work, they do show faces of their participants. And Mozilla, anything that's external, we actually take my, we take acts to make sure that we mask their participants' face because they didn't really agree to that. In some cases, even if they agreed to that, they have no idea that their large face will be in front of someone in Singapore actually, and like what, 500 people actually looking in their face. Given today's like um, technology advances, you could easily do a reverse um, image search and actually seek out that person. So any anonymity that they were seeking for could actually be gone pretty frequently. Also, in terms of like any personal identifiable information, like a computer or what's on their screen, we also take great efforts to mask that, so you can't actually know who that person is. It tells the story of what this person is doing but you can't really identify who this person is. And what's also interesting is before I worked at Mozilla, um, and I used to kind of work with Studio D on the side, um, is we do a lot of reports that are very, publications that are very, very image driven. So this is from a report called A Fought to Eat One, which kind of is about uh, the money transactions in Myanmar. We had a lot of conversations about you know, we are taking photos of small farmers, you know, people who live in villages, and we're using them in our publications. We do pay them when we do an interview, and we try to explain to them what their images are used for, but oftentimes they don't fully know what happens. So the approach we take there, and this was before I joined Mozilla, the approach we take there is that we look at the photo and we make sure that it always puts the participant in good light. Um, they don't, if, uh, if the participant was to see the publication, they don't feel embarrassed, they're not upset, and they look at it like, yeah, it was actually well done. I, I like that photo. I'm happy and proud to have that, my photo in a publication. So that's one of the rules that we follow um, when we want to use photos. Thirdly, design for active consent, not just informed consent. So um, this is in the EU. This, was, this predates the GDPR. This is probably the precursor to GDPR. There's something called the cookie law. Uh, if you are in EU, you'll notice this happens quite a lot. You get a sign that pops up and say, this, uh, this website you know, has cookies. Please click accept or decline. It was really funny, but our participant in Germany said, it's kind of redundant. It's like telling, having a sticker on a car that says, this car runs on gas. Majority of the cars run on gas. Majority of the websites collect cookies. You might as well highlight to me when you don't collect cookies or when your car's not made of gas. That's when I need to know. And like anyone, like you see a bunch of stuff pop up, you just click 
accept without really reading it. One thing that we see that has come up in popularity with a lot of companies is they take their privacy policies or their term and conditions, they strip out all the legal jargon, or the legal jargon is still there, uh, but they help you translate in a way that you understand and it's easy to read. So this is an example from Transparent Classroom, uh, and what it does right there is they translate the legal jargon into simple, easy to understand words that anyone, you or me, can actually understand. So they call it in human words. Because honestly, who has time to read all of this? Another good example is Apple. Um, I think most of, there are quite a lot of iPhones out there in the market. So Apple has this icon called data and privacy icon. And it says that every time you see that icon, it means that we're asking for sensitive um, personal information. So be more aware when this icon shows up. So an example is in the share activity, the icon shows up over there so that you know that your sensitive information is being transmitted. Uh, and then you click into it to find out more. So as a user, you have the ability to understand exactly what you're getting into if you want to. And it's a way to kind of highlight that this is different from what's usually happening. Number four, build for alternative business models. I'm very fortunate to be working for a mission-driven tech company that really believes in putting people over profit. We are here not because we want the largest market share. So a lot of you who are using Chrome out there don't need to say sorry to me. It's okay. You can use your Chrome. What Mozilla really cares about is that we just need enough market share to be able to stay in again and be relevant for people. And the bigger thing is that we are really thinking about fighting for the future of the web. So in this article that was in The Guardian last week, you know, we talk about how our motivations are different. Again, it's quite hard. Not all of us were for not-for-profit, not but Mozilla is motivated by creating a user experience. We don't really care about profits. We don't really care about revenue. Google's main priority is different. Google really is an advertising engine. You know, their priority is really to funnel user data into an enormous advertising agency that accounts for most of the revenue. Apple's motivation is really to get you to buy the next iPhone that comes out or whatever product that comes out. The motivations are different. This is also very common. I'm not sure how often people read their terms and conditions for companies, but you know, terms and conditions do tell users that their data is being sold. They will say things like carefully selected third parties. Carefully selected means the, the party that can give them the most money for your data. That's how they carefully selected them. Um, but this is pretty common, and this is actually from a local website. I kind of blanked out the name, but you can pretty much figure out who that is. It's super popular. And the key adage is really is, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer. You are the product being sold. So some key takeaways. So this is a framework for privacy standards and design. Firstly, adopt a lean data policy. Map out what you need and why. Number two, communicate the effects and impact. So demonstrate the benefits and the risks for collecting and not collecting that piece of data. Number three, build a trusted relationship. Ask for active consent. Provide straightforward privacy settings. Easy opt-outs. Don't hide the opt-out button in a corner in a very dark color that nobody can see. That's not fair. That's dark UX. And lastly, respect the individual. Share out and report considerably when you can. In short, build trust and transparency in every interaction that you have with your user. So before you request for your user's data, ask yourself these questions. Firstly, would you ask for that piece of data if that person was sitting next to you in real life? Two, have I actively informed the user about what I'm collecting? Three, 
can I map w what I am using for the data for and why I'm collecting it? And lastly, the question that trumps all these questions, is it creepy? If it's creepy, don't do it. So to end, you have the responsibility to keep your data safe, all of you here. Thank you. Stand over here. Oh, yes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Venetia. How frightening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we're just going to. Hope you all feel better. I, I can give a separate talk about how to protect your own user privacy, but that's a different <laughs> talk altogether. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we just have a couple of questions. So, what are your thoughts on the Chinese social credit score that was mentioned yesterday? Um, I have my personal thoughts about it, but I still want to visit China as well. So I think I'll restrain on actually commenting. Okay, the, the truth is they are collecting a lot of information and data. Um, users need to be actively aware of what they're collecting and why and pull back. Um, Mozilla actually has a lot of thoughts on that specifically, but I still want to go to China, so I'll hold back on that a little bit. Okay, yes. Okay, and... The world improves in understanding more about human behavior. Would this slow down progress if everyone is not par participating in data sharing? So, as I said before, data sharing isn't bad in itself. We all need some data to make the world move smoothly to improve our user experience. But the thing is really, the users need to have a choice. People, they need to be able to say what they want to share. They need to be able to say why they're sharing and what happens to it. So like in some cases, I would say that the world can actually be better and actually improve when you don't share data or when people are actually really aware about what they're sharing. Okay, thank you, Venetia. Thank you. Okay, and now we'll just like to hand you a token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do this sign.